Welcome to the CSBP Fertilizers Grow Better podcast, sharing knowledge with growers on leading crop nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and other issues impacting the agricultural industry. G'day, everyone. Welcome to the CSBP Grow Better podcast. My name's Gray Johnston, and I'm very excited to be joined today to discuss precision ag and variable rate technology with Graham Murray, our Ag Tech Services Manager at CSBP Fertilisers, and Benji Blevin, Precision Ag Manager at John Deere Australia and New Zealand. Graham, Benji, welcome to the show. G'day. Thanks, Gray. Yeah, thanks, Gray. Thanks for having us. Um, Graham, if we start with you, can you tell me about, I guess, your background and and your role at CSBP and how you ended up with the organisation? Yeah, um, I've got a varied background, but I I started off in in agriculture and I've sort of been through a whole range of different industries from from dairy to to broadacre agriculture, but certainly broadacre is where I spent the majority of my time. Um, And then sort of ended up in a John Deere dealer um, for nearly five years as an integrated solutions manager. Um, before coming to CPP. I've been with CPP for five years now um, in the ag tech space um, through a number of roles. Benji, what, what's your story and what's your background in, in at John Deere? Yeah, so again, it's pretty varied as well, Gray. I, I actually was born in Zimbabwe, grew up there on a tobacco um, and rose property um, for export and immigrated here to Australia with my family. We immigrated to Queensland in 2003. Uh, so yeah, grew up in a slightly different production system, um, but most of my time in Australia has been spent in, in small grains cropping regions. Um, you know, studied engineering and outside of that, uh, went, went on to work for John Deere and spent three, just over three years in Western Australia as a precision ag specialist, uh, working with our dealers and, and directly with customers in, in the West and then came over and did the same job in Queensland and the Northern Territory for a couple of years before stepping into this role, which is the precision ag manager role, um, which is really responsible for bringing new precision ag technology to the market uh, here locally and, and also providing a bit of an interface to our factories overseas on what our local uh, needs and requirements are and making sure that those are getting met. So you're talking precision ag there. I guess if we start with the with the real basics, what do we mean by precision ag and and what are the sort of things and technologies that, that we're talking about in this space? Yeah, so I think uh, from my perspective, it's all sort of began with, with GPS and, and GPS guidance on, on machines, Gray, where we were able to put a data point against a position within the field and then start to understand and, and be more precise with how not only the machine um, moves through the field automatically, but also the information that we can, can collect and therefore start to do more with less. And at the end of the day, that's what I think precision aid comes down to is being more accurate with how we move through the field, how we apply products um, and how we take product off a field. Uh, so that you know we're, we're spending less fuel, we're spending less time, and uh, we're saving on product where we can and optimizing for a, you know, a better outcome at the end of the day, whether that's, whether that's yield or soil health, um, we're improving the systems that, that we're engaging with. So then precision ag could be anything from a range of, you, know, you talk GPS, so I guess auto steer would fall within that definition, all the way to va- variable rate inputs and, and maybe crop protection or or other applications of, of variable rate. Are we seeing different rates of adoption of those different technologies across the market? What's your observation there, Benji? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we've seen, well, GPS has been around for a long time now, but um, really what started as a, a retrofit kit that you would fit to a, a machine that you've already purchased or a tractor that you've already purchased over time, we've moved to a position where all of that technology comes from the factory and um, auto steer is sort of just part of part and parcel of owning machinery these days where in the past it was about fitting that to uh, machines after the after the purchase so you know that that adoption has has pretty much widespread across the industry and and we see that with all technologies things like section control where you can shut off parts of a boom or parts of uh, of your cedar you know there's less adoption in that in that technology but that's grown considerably over the years and that's all around how easy it is to use um, and, and access, I think. So we're seeing that growth, same with variable rate technology, as that becomes easier and as data collection becomes easier uh, and more automated, we see the adoption increase because we're just removing all of that manual work that's required. And I think any time that there's manual work involved, it becomes a challenge, particularly when you're at those parts of the season where 
time is critical and you've got to get the work done at the end of the day. And one of the things that's going to drop off is any of that manual um, data entry or, or capture or collection. So Benji touched there on variable rate, Graham, and obviously as a fertiliser uh, supplier, we have interest in how growers are using variable rate technology, particularly to apply crop nutrition. Do you have a sense of what's the uptake in WA and, and what are the barriers to adoption in, in WA, Graham? Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think it'd be somewhere around 20% do some form of variable rate. And I think there's, there's um, some people can sort of make it very complicated. It's very simple. And, and variable rate can be something as simple as just going patching out an area um, that needs a, some additional K, or it can be the case of having a prescription file that's going to vary rates across the whole paddock. So there's a broad spectrum there around what people can do, and that sort of influences a bit of that adoption rate. Yeah, and just to add to that, I was going to say that you know you think you look at something like Auto Track, it's it's quite easy to quantify in terms of okay, I'm going from manually steering a a piece of equipment and and knowing that there's a lot of overlap and underlap, and to okay, Auto Steer can control that. Where I think sometimes it can become a little bit harder to quantify the impact of implementing a variable rate program um, and knowing that that's, that's what's resulted in a certain outcome. So then how, how do we attempt to quantify that? What are the, I guess, what are the types of, um, what are the types of ways in which variable rate is getting used for a fertilizer program? And, and what are the ways in which people might be, might be trying to quantify that? Do you have a sense there, Graham? Um, look, it's, there's two, two ways to look at it. Some of it's around efficiency. <clears throat> so some people are certainly looking to sort of say, how can we, we cut back on, on product? But ultimately, it actually comes down to really sort of, once you understand some variability in the paddock, I think that's where things like yield mapping, where satellite imagery sort of helps us understand, well, hang on, we're not getting the same sort of um, response across the whole paddock. To then sort of start looking at going, well, what can we do to either increase the the yield like is there something lacking in a particular area or does this part of the paddock actually require more and once you sort of got that understanding then it's quite easy to sort of um, apply that product to those areas um, I think in the past some of that um, understanding of what what you should be doing was what was some of the challenges that historically have been there with VRT whereas now I think um, a lot of those answers are a lot easier they're a lot well a lot um, better understood um, and the option of picking these things up is a lot easier so the variable rate technologies that are available to to growers in WA at the moment, what would they be? I suppose Benji might want to jump in here too, but to me, it's, it's, you basically got um, spreading, um, spraying, and then seeding. So it's the three three main application forms, um, and there's different variations within those as well. I don't yeah. know if you want to add anything else to that, Benji? Yeah, no. Look, and I think as far as core technologies, we that you sort of need to to achieve that you've got. You know the display in the cab, um, the the receiver on on, on the machine, and then a, a rate controller of some form that can adjust the rate to match the prescription or, or the, the the application rate that you're looking to achieve in those those zones across the field. So those are the sort of the foundational technologies that nowadays I think you know as I said before previously that was a retrofit. Everything had a cost on top of that equipment you had, whereas now that's sort of all included and the capability is there. And it's it's about whether um, you're utilizing that that capability or not and but yeah very easy to to implement these days once you as, as Graham said it, it could be as simple as something like a, a peer replacement from a yield map um, you know it could be uh, you know liming a variable rate liming application based on pH or something like that so it can it can be quite simple um, but it, you can also then start to dig into your soil types and and all applications um, being you know, variable rate applied. So I think it's maybe worth almost stepping through the process if, if we can. You've talked a bit there about identifying variability within the paddock, Benji, and I guess, Graham, that probably seems to be one of the starting points that, that where, where a girl needs to start when they're thinking about whether variable rate makes sense or, or if they do want to apply variable rate. Correct. <clears throat> yep. Firstly, understanding, have I got variability in my paddock? Um, uh, there's some, some fairly good research out there around saying, well, a certain percentage of variability is worthwhile doing something with. And then if it's, you know, if, if you're only talking a little bit, it's probably not worth the effort. But I think my my um, history has sort of shown that most paddocks have a fair chunk of variability in them and there's not very many uniform paddocks. So first thing is understand this variability. Um, 
and that can then it's a case of quantifying that. So um, what people call zoning a paddock, and that's actually defining finding those areas of different productivity, and that can be done in different ways. So you can use things like just um, satellite photos. So sometimes if you're looking at soil types, you can actually see just differences in soils. Um, you can look, use things like biomass imagery, which is looking at the plant's response to to whatever is going on in that in that paddock. Um, and then there's obviously things like yield data to, to look at what product we're getting off in. And I suppose we're sort of moving into other things around quality of data, as uh, quality of grain as well. So where it's moisture, those types of things as well. So basically once you've got that quantified, those areas, then um, you can sort of dive in and sort of start exploring as to what's causing this. And so Benji, I guess growers would be using their yield monitors to, as, as Graham mentioned, um, as, as one way of measuring that, that variability? Yeah, I think absolutely. It's a, good, it's a great starting point to, to know where to look and where to start. And, you know, you may even find that, you know, you, you might target the top five fields uh, to start with because they have, the, you know, the highest variability. And Graham sort of mentioned quite a few different sources of information that you can use to try and understand what's driving that variability. And I think one of our biggest challenges in the past when it comes to variable rate has been trying to collect all that information and put it together in a single place where you can make sense of it. And then all the time that it takes to do that and then actually apply and implement that program um, takes a lot of work and commitment. And what we're starting to break down are those barriers where the data collection is automated and then you know, our, our platform, for example, but it's kind of consistent across the industry. It doesn't matter what color you're talking about now. It's, it's really around trying to get to a cloud-based system where information can be securely and easily shared between different providers that are able to contribute these sources of information that allow you to really understand what's driving that variability and then implement a, a plan to, to go and do something different. So that's probably, I think, one of the biggest barriers that the process hasn't changed, but I think the uh, how we get there and how, the, how much it's been automated. I think a lot of people think about automation as machines being automated driving through the field, but data automation and flow is, is a it's a big thing that's changed over the last you know five to ten years. So we we talked then about how to understand what the variability might be in the paddock, and Benji, there you started moving us towards okay, now you understand that there's some variability and there might be new uh, data automation processes to to help us understand and, and knit that information together uh, more better, as I would sometimes say. Then I guess there's a step in between there before you can actually take a take a management action, which is understanding how to how to develop what that management action should be. Is that is that something that is that something also that that growers are are grappling with? Um, yeah, and I, I think. Like from a CCP perspective, um, things like Neologic, uh, things like Detect, who are, are actually sort of taking samples. And I, I think that's really important to actually say well, you, you need to ground truth. You need to sort of collect some data from the field. It's, it's um, somewhat risky just to sort of take a, a geospatial sort of layer and then just go and you know, load, the, load the spreader up and go and apply something. So it's still that best practice of collect some samples. But now you've got an understanding of where you should be collecting samples from. A process like New Logic, which looks at agronomics, economics, understanding what that target yield is for that area, and then getting a very informed um, recommendation around what to go and apply, um, makes that process somewhat easier. In the past, some of those steps weren't there. And, and again, to Benji's point, we sort of made those processes easier to sort of say, well, hey, you've, you've uh, quantified the area. We now understand what a constraint is. We can give you uh, an instruction as to what to go and do, and then we've got the technology now to actually go and apply that in the paddock. You've, you've got to generate that recommendation. Um, and again, it's about engaging with all the different people that help make those decisions on farm because you, you, you can have all the information, but then you also need to know how to digest that and, and what that recommendation should be. So again, that we use something that's called an API, which is really, it's, it's a handshake agreement between software platforms that allows data to flow, you know, platforms like, um, CSP, CSPPs or it could be you know, an ag world, for example, or wherever that agronomist is using or, or doing that planning um, or recommendation, uh, it's about putting the information in that place um, in an easy way for them to do that work. So you've both talked a lot about it's very easy now, it's very simple now, and maybe I'm just put words in your mouth there. But then we've got the point which Graham made earlier, which is perhaps we're only seeing adoption rates of 
of something like 20%, will there just naturally be a an increase of, of adoption as as companies like John Deere and CSBP have invested to make these processes easier? What What's needed to really uh, drive adoption in, in the market, given that we have a strong sense that there probably are some productivity or efficiency gains to be to be generated here. I don't know. Do you want to have a crack at that, Benji? Yeah. No. Look, I think we're we've made it easier. I think there's still a long way to go. Um, you know, we're not there yet. That's that's for sure. So it's a good point. I mean, things are easier than what they were, but there are still manual steps involved. And um, so we will continue down that that journey. And I think models will also progress in this space um and graham may be able to have you know more comments on that but i think as we move further down down the road we will have more data that's able to be collected we'll have better sensors on equipment that maybe as they pass through the field we can capture more information about the crop about the soil about soil health um and the more data that we're able to collect at that point i think the more we're able to automate when it comes to decision making as well uh so that we're continuing down that journey, um, but we, you know we're not there yet. So that, I think you're right; adoption will continue to grow. But you know, at the moment, there's still quite a few manual steps involved, and depending on what level you're trying to get to when it comes to variable rate technology. But yeah, it's a, it's a great point, I think. And I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Graham, as well. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's somewhat um, it's easy for us to sort of become biased when you've been in the industry for so long. Like what we've got now is just so much easier than what it used to be, but yeah, you do have to recognise that it's still not, you know, completely seamless. So no. um, we can't sort of put two thicker rose glasses on. Um, I think the the other thing around that adoption curve is economic drivers. So I suppose while people are making money with what they're doing at the moment, um, there's not that economic driver. And I suppose to Benji's point, when Precision Ag, well, when um, guidance came in, it was a very easy calculation to do to say, well, look, we've, we've reduced overlap by 10, 15%. You, you've just made an instant, instantaneous savings around of 10 or 15% of it, all your inputs. So you could actually do some economics to sort of say, yeah, this makes sense. With VRT, it's a little bit trickier to actually get that crystal clear picture around, I've done this, this is what the economic outcome is. Um, without you putting in some, some trial strips or something to say, well, look, what was my paddock average? What response have I actually got from this? So I think some of those things um, have been some of the barriers too to say, well, it's not as clear cut to, to make a change. But I think also we're making those things a little bit easier now that you can actually understand what was the economic outcome of doing this. Um, I think it's more around uh, collaboration and partnerships with different parties too. Um, I don't think any of us have the full end-to-end -end solution, um, which is one of those barriers. So as we make these processes easier, we collaborate more, we're sort of just knocking off those barriers to entry for, for people to sort of pick up those opportunities to improve the efficiencies. So Graham, you touched a bit before on New Logic as a solution for developing the recommendation and ground truthing those recommendations based on soil testing, plant testing, the the CSBP suite of, of the way we like to um, recommend that growers uh, manage their enterprise. You're also been heavily involved in the development of Decipher Ag over over a recent period, and and in particular focused on uh, making it uh, more user friendly for for variable rate. Would you just like the opportunity to touch on what's been happening in that space? Yeah, look, I suppose um, in Decipher Ag, uh, it's always had the ability to create zones, had the ability to create prescription files, but some of those little little things that you sort of don't really appreciate that if, when you start going into variable rate, actually, I'll just total up how much product you need for an application um, across the whole program um, is a real challenge. Uh, so we've sort of made things easier when you do paddock planning now, you can include variable rate applications in that paddock plan. It'll give you a total of how much product you need by month um, or, or, and total. We've made it so that you can create prescription files with one click of the button. So that um, if you've done real rates for all your farm or some of them, one click of the button, it spits a prescription file out in the format that's required for your um, brand of machinery. So whether it's John Deere, whether it's Case um, or, or other ones. So we sort of made a lot of those processes easier. Even little things like zoning paddocks we've made easier. So the old process would be you'd have to click on every paddock, uh, pick a uh, satellite image, create a zone. You can actually do that in bulk now. So you can sort of go in and say, look, I want to use 
15 years of peak biomass imagery average those across the whole whole farm uh, with one click of the button it'll actually go through and zone every paddock in the whole farm um, so things like that are you know great leaps forward to what what used to be there we still got a way to go so we still got ways we can sort of improve and that's that's sort of on our roadmap of what we're doing and Benji, I understand that at John Deere, you've been developing work planner to to make these kind of things easier as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we, you know, we've got quite a few tools in OpsCenter. We we've got a basic prescription tool that can be used off a, you know, a single data layer, whether that be for yield or a, um, an average of yield over a number of seasons. Um, I suppose what we what work planner is is all about the implementation of that recommendation and how we move from. Uh, that recommendation, whether that comes from the Cypher or any other platform, um, Work Planner allows you to sort of select what paddocks you're going to, you know, what products you're applying, what rates you're going to be applying. That could be a prescription or could be a flat rate. Um, uh, you can provide some instructions and then you send it wirelessly to the machine. Uh, it sits in there automatically. You don't have to import it manually or anything like that. And then the operator, as they drive into a paddock, it pops up with a notification saying, hey, this is the work that is planned against this field. And it becomes more of a process of reviewing the details of that work and making sure that's what, what should be getting completed. And um, I think one of the biggest challenges we've had and the industry has is quality of data. So if you're having to manually input information in the cab of the display, that's the source of that information. And if it's not meaningful, then you have no idea what it is down the track. So work plan is all about removing the manual entry that happens in the cab so that uh, that information that you, you come to the end of the season, you've got this yield information, you can quickly understand all of the steps that and all of the applications that led to that outcome. And I think Work Planner, part of that, we also created an API handshake where if you're planning in another tool, you don't want to duplicate that. You don't want manual entry uh, in two systems. So we've opened up the door there to allow, you know, whether that's an agronomist or a farmer themselves planning in another tool to then send that through automatically and populate their work plan in op center and send it to to a to a gen 4 display in a, in a tractor a combine or a sprayer so it's it's trying to again it's one of those barriers where implementation was was tough because you might have used a usb to bring in all your prescription maps and now we're trying to trying to remove that hurdle and, and as graham was saying moving from um individual fields to batch processing and and and, uh, and wireless transfer so i think you know hopefully that's a change it's quite a new product for us um but yeah, you know, getting more and more adoption on it, which is good. So Graham used the phrase rose-coloured glasses before, uh, but you've both been very positive about how seamless and easy it is to, uh, to adopt VRT these days. Uh, if there are growers out there who, who, who are thinking, gee, it's not that seamless, or, or if they're thinking, wow, it sounds good, I'd like to give it a crack, I guess what, what's the first step that, that those people should be, should be taking? Graham, do you, want to have a, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, look, um, look. If if you haven't haven't tried it before, I'd say just keep it simple. You know, um, pick your low hanging fruit, and and you know, if you want to dabble, do something with a non critical sort of product. So lime is a is a really good starting point. We've all got variability in um, in paddocks, and sometimes just putting that lime in a different part of the paddock, you get better benefit from it. So um, I'd say yeah, don't don't sort of just dive headfirst into into seeding, which is a time critical event. You know, you, you make a mistake at seeding time, you, you pay for it all year. Um, so pick something easy. Um, to Benji's point earlier on, maybe pick a couple of paddocks that you know you've got variability in. Get comfortable with the system um, and play. You know, it's I think um, the tools are far more easy now that. Pick a paddock, go through your zone. It. If you understand your paddocks, quite often you can actually just draw your zones and you'll be pretty close. You don't have to go through a highly complicated process to get there. Um, and then call out for support. You know, um, CCP is here to help with these processes and, and I'm sure John Deere is the same. I'll, I'll add to that from our perspective, I guess, very similar to Graham. I think play with things, you know, use the platform if you haven't before. I think strip trials are also... On-farm strip trials have never have never been easier to do. You know, just changing changing an application rate in the cab, and and the, the great thing now is that the, the analysis tools, uh, from our perspective in operations center, make it really easy to understand. Okay, where I played forty kilograms a hectare versus fifty versus sixty, what that yield outcome was um, that that was in those zones. So strip trials become really easy to implement and, and start to just 
play and get an understanding of what that response is like. Um, I think, yeah, reach out to John Deere dealer has the capacity to help you get started, whether it's about creating field boundaries, because that is, you know, probably one of the things I talk about a lot is field boundaries because it's, it's critical. It's, it's sort of that file structure that you need to collect information and collect data on farms. So that's always a, a key starting point. Um, but yeah, I think those are probably some of the, the easy steps. And we, we have an app version. That's one thing I would say is that the app's probably the easiest thing to use. So just download, just get onto the app store, download it and, and it's free. So it's, uh, I guess, pretty easy to, to have a crack and, and see if there's any value there. So is there anything else you see on the horizon to, to, encourage, to encourage adoption uh, in this market? Yeah, absolutely great. I think um, always working on, you know, collecting more information and more data that makes it um, easier to, to implement a change on farm. And, you know, one thing that we recognize is, is critical is we, we get yield information and yield data from a, from a combine and we have done for quite a long time, but there's always been the missing piece of, of quality. So, you know, quality and yield make a much more complete picture of um, how that crop has performed. So I think we understand that need um, in the market. And I think hopefully soon, if everyone, you know, stay tuned before too long, we'll have something that can, can solve that. But together you can understand that both the amount that you've applied of, of nitrogen and, and the timing of that and how that's affected um, not just the yield outcome, but the, the quality. So we get, we get paid for both. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities there as well as understanding and, and improving nitrogen use efficiency um, at the pad, at the paddock level, so some some great opportunities there, and I think with those two data layers, it becomes a lot easier to move to a more seamless um, variable rate program. And Graham, I guess um, CSBP Detect, uh, which is a program that you're heavily involved in, is also uh, an angle to understanding that that nitrogen story and and that uh, yield and yield and protein trade off. Definitely, and and I, I think the the real opportunity with with CFP Detect is is having that in season sort of um, up to date uh, information to make those decisions. And, and I suppose that's part of the evolution of of where we sort of got to is that in the past you're having to base a lot of decisions on historical information, and to bring that sort of decision or database decision point to within the season um, just enables the variable rate a lot easier. You've got an informed decision. Here's what the status of my plan is. Here's an area I can go and actually do something with it. Brilliant. Some positive messages there from our guests. Uh, that'll do us today on the uh, CSBP Grow Better podcast. But thank you, Benji Blevin, uh, Precision Ag Manager at John Deere Australia and New Zealand, and Graham Murray, Ag Tech Services Manager here at CSBP, for joining us. What a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, hey, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having us. Good on you guys. Thank you also for joining us on the CSPP Grow Better podcast. Remember to jump on our socials at CSPP Fertilizers uh, to like, subscribe, rate and review the podcast and jump into our DMs if you've got any suggestions for future shows. That's it from us. Goodbye. See you later. I've been Gray Johnston. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the CSBP Grow Better podcast. For more information about CSBP, please visit csbp-fertilizers.com.au or connect with us on social media at CSBP Fertilizers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn.